So, all right, here we are. We are uh, here for the Data <laughs> Protection Breakfast Club, the Footloose episode. You can see behind me, Kevin Bacon. Uh, and we're talking to one of our favorite people today, Stephanie King, who's the Deputy General Counsel of Privacy and Product at Twitter. We've known her for a while, and she's an incredible leader, uh, a leader of teams. Yeah. She's been a general counsel before, um, and now she's in a, uh, a, a big leadership role at Twitter. So uh, we're really, really excited to, to bring her into the conversation. What do you want to say? She's a big, nah, she's a big boss lady, man. And I like, it's been interesting to watch her like, uh, I don't even know, man. She's always kind of been pretty senior, but like just meteoric kind of growth in what she's responsible for. And you know, what's great about her is like, she's not one dimensional, like, you know, some privacy people are like privacy, you know, but she's very kind of, uh, she's much broader in the way she thinks about uh, her role. Uh, I, her and I, she and I talked about it quite a bit, but um, she's just, Twitter's lucky to have her. I'm just going to make it simple. And, you know, next role, formerly ad role, um, uh, is one of my favorite ad tech companies. And I used to do a lot of work with them when I was at Oracle and still do here uh, at Salesforce. And, you know, my experience working with them when Stephanie was there and then post after she kind of laid the infrastructure for what it is now, um, it's always, they're very dynamic, man. And they always want to do the right thing. Um, you know, I think it's one of the more above board operations in the ad tech space and not, not, you know, not to criticize other players, but like, they just, they know what they're doing. I think a lot of that is definitely. One of the things I respected about ad role was always that they, they didn't get distracted by shiny ball. They like, that's right. We're going to be really good at performance retargeting. This is how we're going to do it. This is the data we're going to use to do it. And I remember I, I spoke on a panel with their head of product um, back and several years ago, Greg Fulton. And I was just like very blown away by how they never, like they were able to stay focused on what they did well and keep doing it for the SMB market at scale. Um, it was impressive. And now, now they yeah. built a holding company and AdWall was a piece of a larger holding company within a much bigger marketing play. And they continue to thrive and survive. It's cool to see. Yeah, they split into like two or three, right? Like, I don't remember. I, I've seen it, like a couple of roles in there, you know? Yeah, it's kind of right. cool. Well, we'll, it's, we'll it's cool. It's cool. Take time. Cool all right. Take time. Here okay. it is. All right, man. Let's do it. All right. Or, or Cindy Lauper shirt. <laughs> all right. Now we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need this, a background? This, no, no, no you're good. The star-shaped hoop earrings are everything. Aren't they everything? <laughs> this was from a Zynga. Um, we had an 80s day at Zynga, and I had hot pink <laughs> leg warmers, but in the current Zoom environment, you, you know, yeah. those were lost in time, and you wouldn't be able to appreciate them now anyway, so. No, we appreciate oh. you. We, we appreciate you. No, we definitely. Uh, so, All so, right, I got important questions. I, yeah, wait, hold on, ahead. Andy. I'm derailing yes. everything off the top. I got important questions because our theme today involves a, a, I don't know, is it a musical? I don't even know what to call Footloose. Or, but, like, but I need to know about both of you guys, um, especially you, Stephanie. I want to know like what your dancing vibes were in the 80s. Are you a big dancer? I did. I was known to dance in my room to Cyndi Lauper, Madonna. But then at times I was like super chill, uh, Tom Petty. Oh, nice. Yeah. But, but yeah, the eighties for me were, you know, middle school dances, which were like, you know, like this. <laughs> well, you got to leave room for the Holy spirit. Yes. yes, exactly. And then with, you know, <laughs> shoes would come off, but we were all in socks <laughs> with like the knee length skirts. So, so my, my, my recollection is the same. Uh, a lot of bar mitzvah dancing for me when I was growing up. Uh, a lot of mixers, we called them in, in middle school, mixers between us and other schools. And the hot thing was skids with a Z. I don't know if you had a pair of oh. skids, but they were like, um, they, they were like uh, um, overalls, but like plaid, like hot pink plaid overalls. And the skid symbol was like a road sign with a car skidding off. Uh, everybody wearing those and dancing and then in a circle, you know, yelling like, 
go Stephanie, go Stephanie. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like that, yeah. But yeah, often the dances, I would start with all the boys lined up on like one side of the gym wall and all the girls on the other side of the gym wall and like nobody in the middle. And then the sixth graders didn't touch. And then, um, you know, the seventh graders got closer. And then one of my teachers <laughs> in eighth grade said, and the eighth graders end up like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, lot was, happens. a lot happens in two years that's right a lot, uh, a lot, yeah. a lot of changes a lot but of there changes. was good dancing um yeah. there was good dancing in the 80s yeah people don't, people don't dance anymore man not, not like they used to i was obsessed i'm a little younger than you guys but in the late 80s i was obsessed with paula abdul like obsessed it was bad and yeah. i had like her record like i had a record and i would listen to this thing and i would always imagine myself being kind of like her dance partner which is really weird and, and, um, you learn. <laughs> yeah i was not but i'm not a, i'm definitely not a good dancer definitely not a good enough dancer to dance with paula abdul but anyway that was my 80s crush for sure paula abdul that's a good one paula abdul that's solid man before we get into it which video did you like the best because mm. their cold-hearted snake video very good <laughs> Straight up, the straight well, up one, video. Ooh, straight up. I, yeah. That's where I was gonna go. That straight up was my jam, and uh, I sadly know that song. Right now, I could sing it for you. I will not. Let's move on to privacy because there's a lot of important topics <laughs> we need to talk about. Too good. Which we kind of didn't need to worry about as much in the '80s, or maybe we did, but no, different, different ways. <laughs> we well, the Soviet. The, well, we were still, you know, the Soviet Union was really hot back then. So we yeah, <laughs> actually, you remember a lot of, around that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The old Berlin let's, Wall. Let's kick it off for real. We're with Stephanie, who's the Deputy General Counsel at Twitter of Privacy and Product, and um, also a child of the 80s like us. So it's great to be with you. And I think we'll just, we usually just start with kind of like the backstory of the person, how you got into privacy. I mean, for you, it's been sort of interesting because it, you wove in and out of it a little bit. And now, now it's a big part of your job, but um, tell us like, you know, obviously you started at, at uh, Latham, maybe were you doing any of that work there? Not directly. I was really more corporate attorney doing uh, venture deals when they were around. I came into the law firm when nobody remembers and now it doesn't feel like a real recession, but <laughs> before was a, another mini recession. But I really started getting into it when I moved to Gilead. And uh, that was my first in-house job. And they were trying to get uh, Safe Harbor certified. And so there were lots of meetings trying to get a biotech company who'd been around for over a decade, uh, records in order, and to be able to do the self-certification. And I, I kind of rode sidecar to the attorney who was appointed to do that. And that's where I first um, started really focusing a little bit on privacy. And then when I moved to Zynga, um, I, again, was in more of a corporate do all the things kind of role, uh, but over time moved into heading up the product compliance group. And so of course that's consumer data and COPPA was a really big thing uh, for gaming that we were all focused on. GDPR was just a, not even like a blip in people's eyes. It was kind of there at the time, but not, it hadn't been passed yet. So there was a lot of focus on, on COPPA and FTC um, guidance, which is very different from the world we're in now in many ways. We have how, did plus. Deal, how did you all deal with that at Zynga? Like a lot of children playing Farmville and other like kinds of those games that were really hot. Like, cause you knew, you knew you were gonna have a lot of visits, visits to the site, app downloads. Like, how did you, how did, how did you guys deal with that? Well, I think an interesting thing is as with all tech company or social media or social companies, it's, you are not targeting children. And that, that was true at Zynga. They were not, that was not the target audience at all. Um, crazily enough, adults really like playing games like <laughs> Farmville and Cityville. And so, um, you know, a lot of the counseling is around understanding that and counseling the game teams around um, what does it mean? How do you interpret COPPA? So, uh, the area where I spent even more of my time was we had Zynga.org, which was the nonprofit arm. And we were trying to do partnerships with 
um, nonprofits who were trying to teach kids. So how could you use um, Words with Friends, for example, to, to help kids with, with um, learning how to spell and engaging their brain in that way? Or how could you use other game mechanics and, and um, that could help kids learn? And that was really challenging because you were trying to do something good, but you were targeting the educational space, which of course is kids, and then interpreting COPPA, uh, trying to do the right thing was, was something that was um, definitely challenging to navigate through. Yeah. Should COPPA be enforced more strictly? Like, do you guys really think that there aren't a billion COPPA violations going on out there all over the place? I'm sure there are. I think one of the challenges with COPPA is you've got companies that are trying, one, it's hard, it's still hard to interpret, even when they did mm -hmm. the amendments. Um, and I'm not as close to it now as I was before, but it was as a company trying to do the right thing. It was actually hard to interpret in a lot of ways. And I think there are a lot of companies, especially, especially small startups and the educational space that are trying to navigate the rules um, to do the right thing. If I'm remembering correctly at the time, you were, it was interpreted as you actually had to send like a physical postcard <laughs> to parents and get them to mail it back, yeah. you know, um, and were any of the digital options for getting parental consent enough. Um, and there were efforts to try to get infrastructure up that could do that so that you could actually move forward and innovate in the space. Um, so again, I'm not as close to it now, but uh, that was definitely a big part of my life was just how do we do this, especially in the nonprofit space that was trying to do good things and leverage tech uh, and gaming mechanics for to help kids learn and connect. So were you aware of like how many privacy issues would follow when you went from Zynga to AdRoll? Because when I entered ad tech, I was not. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was aware a bit because at Zynga, they were also building their own ad tech stack. We had both mobile and web. And so part of my role was supporting the ad tech teams. And so I had some sense, but again, GDPR hadn't passed yet. So it was, it was still getting negotiated and how would it, what would, where would it end up? And e-privacy directive was there, but, but as we know, you know, the, the, um, there were not 4% signs. <laughs> a privacy directive at the time. So um, it was there and you had to navigate it, but it was, it was not the same. So going to AdRoll, no, I did not. I knew there were going to be privacy issues for sure. And that my first uh, full-time lawyer hire was privacy counsel. Um, shout out to Scott. Ha, shout out to Scott. Cause um, <laughs> one of the people asked me like, why are you going to ad tech? And I said, cause this company is trying to do it right. And they're trying to they have a reputation for caring about privacy and this is going to get more complicated with more data. And so I would like to be there trying to make it better because um, advertising is not going away. It's been around since human beings traded, right? <laughs> so in some form. So I would say that the three of our companies when we were in ad tech specifically were trying to do the right thing. Uh, you know, as those companies go, there's so many that were just building tech as fast as they could, doing exactly every single possible thing they could do with data. And when I left Ameritrade, they, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. Like this yeah. my boss was the chief privacy officer and he was like, you're going to have a lot of privacy issues there. And I remember saying like, what do you mean? It's a cookie. Like, how, how am I going to have privacy issues with a cookie? And he was just like, you'll see. You, I promise you, you'll see. And, he, and you, of course, when I joined, the CEO at DataZoo was one of the people that had been involved in early conversations of the drafting of the self-regulatory codes. And he was like, privacy is going to be a big thing. And so he was yeah. exactly right. And, and it, was good, it was good to see companies like AdRoll, good to see, um, Pedro, when you were at Oracle, like those companies, Blue Kai was the first DMP that when I was at Ameritrade, we bought Blue Kai. So I did that deal that was one of my first forays into ad tech. So we just all started to see it at the same time. Um, and it was sort of interesting because like, I didn't expect that at all, but then it just sort of, like you said, stuff, it's like hit me, hit me in the face right when I got in there. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and it ended up being, it, it, it was a major part of the job. Um, even as a GC, I worked really closely with Scott. And then um, of course, Scott uh, went on to bigger, bigger things. <laughs> five weeks before GDPR. So then it became my 
almost my full time, full time plus. <laughs> uh, really got in the weeds. Um, I had a big whiteboard wall in our space um, that had lots of colorful markers that my team called, oh, that's Stephanie's beautiful mind of how she's <laughs> connecting all the dots. <laughs> With GDPR, any privacy directive, and uh, you know FTC issues or self-regulatory <laughs> regs, and uh, Scott and I would stand there, and I'd be like, "Do, do I have this right? Well, what if it goes this way?" And uh, yeah, it was up for many months, and would adjust as we learn more. Uh, Scott's been in the game for a long time. He obviously went to Twitter, and then you went to Twitter. So yeah. clearly, clearly, you parted well because then you rejoined each other. So like. Yeah. Um, and and uh, now he's on your team there. And um, and so, like, tell us about that transition as well, like moving from, you know, kind of, I don't know, Admiral sort of like similar to data, similar size to data as you like maybe an adolescent instead of an early startup. Um, but like, how, what was that like for you transitioning then back sort of over to Twitter again? Bigger <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the interesting, it was, it was very fortunate, the opportunity to go to Twitter and um, something that was, I think, interesting to Twitter about me was that I had both the consumer side with Zynga and then also the ad tech side with AdRoll, which is now called NextRoll. And um, so that was, that was good because the, the team that, um, the teams I now lead, they counsel on both the consumer side and the revenue side. And one of the main things we try to focus on is making sure both sides of the house know what the impact of decisions are on the other side of the house. Um, and, and so this was an, an attractive role for me because I got to combine both of those sets of experience in one company and get to focus on uh, privacy and consumer protection um, issues. And I used to joke when I was at Next Role with Scott of, hey, you have the best part, you have the best legal job at Next Role because you're a front and center with our product teams and you're helping to push out what the world experiences and sees. And, um, and that's really neat that that's, you know, what you get to focus on. So when this opportunity presented itself, it was it was it was a great opportunity to do that at a company that um, whether you love it or hate it, it it impacts the world. And so uh, so that was the transition. And I get to work with really amazing people who have been doing um, privacy and product counseling for many years, uh, some many years at Twitter, some many years at Twitter and other places and in the government, um, looking at it from the government perspective. And so it's been, I learn a ton from this team um, as well. So the transition's been everything I hoped it would be in, in terms of getting to focus in this area. And it's really interesting to see how privacy is now. Um, it's not a siloed, sidelined thing. Right, it's not just compliance. It's not just. Uh, it's getting used in other ways. You know, we see the antitrust uh, conversations happening. How is privacy being used as a competitive advantage? Uh, it's super interesting. Absolutely. How and so when now that you're at a big platform, um, and that, you know, obviously Twitter is playing a big role in the content that the world sees and the content that gets amplified. I'm speaking specifically of our illustrious president. Um, how involved is your team, if at all, in the content conversation um, around what gets uh, you know, flagged one way or another? Or is that just a completely different team? Like how does Twitter go about thinking about how it governs content? Just curious. Yeah, so that uh, I will say there are a lot of people much smarter than I am thinking about this all the time at Twitter. Um, and it's super complex, of course. But our team, I'll focus on what our team does, which uh, the product council team is, is very focused on counseling on the, the, how the product um, may enforce or uh, support this policy decisions. So our teams are in there with the pro direct lines with the product folks and engineering. Um, and we work very closely with trust and safety in partnership with them um, as well. So it is a you know group effort, but the product council team is, is helping to build the things, council, the teams that are building the tooling 
um, to help us make um, enforce the policy decisions that are that are made. One of the reasons we chose Footloose, right, is the it, we joke about it, but is is about expression, and and that's one of the things that sits at the at the the like the foundation of why Twitter was created. You know, so it's 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 cool to see to be able to do something in our lawyer jobs that has like a broader impact on the world. Period. I mean, that's a big reason I took the job that I took now is that a big component uh, of the Alice platform is giving and donations, and um, there's something else going on there as as opposed to just well, we're an ABM marketing uh, tool, um, which you know uh, is used in this way to generate leads or demand like in Twitter in the same way it's not just like a platform for for you know saying what your re favorite recipe is and doing ads around it it's much more than that and so um, it's not surprising to me that um, that you were attracted to it and that the team has so many smart people that are interested in working on it for sure yeah yeah and shout out to Twitter for getting a lot of things right I think I'm just that's my opinion but like i remember when the George Floyd incident happened and people turned to the streets uh, within a day or two of, of the, you know, that news breaking, um, there was some uh, outrageous post by a national leader of ours on the platform. And it was the first time I'd ever seen Twitter limit content. Right. And, and when I saw what the content was, I it was, I mean, I was very proud that Twitter was doing the right thing and not allowing for the amplification of misinformation, lies, or just confusing, you know, confusing data. Um, I, I'm not really asking a question. I'm just saying, like, Stephanie, shout out to Twitter for doing the right thing. Like, I, a lot, a lot. And standing up to bullying really well, in my opinion. Um, and I know that that's not a privacy topic, but who cares? Like, I think Twitter is getting it the most right. At least from where I, from my vantage point, that's what it looks like. So shout out to you and the team and all your colleagues doing all this good stuff. Yeah, well, we appreciate that. These are tough, tough, um, tough issues to grapple with. And, and um, we're trying, the company is yeah. really trying to do the right thing and, and, and walk the right line and um, provide context like you will we focus a lot on how do we provide context so that the conversation and the expressions can still happen but people have context so yeah, that's right. what you're seeing yeah what's the Super right thing what's the um when, when we loop back to privacy for a moment like what's the in your mind um what's the functional difference between a product product council and a privacy council and then I would add a layer of both their teams that Pedro and I have worked on and run commercial. Like as a lone GC or part of a bigger team when I was part of a much bigger team, like don't we all have to know privacy at this point? I think that's an excellent question. And it's, it's one that's, um, it's like a double-edged sword in a way. And I say that not you know, negatively, it's just uh, to answer your question, yes, I think everybody needs to be an ambassador for privacy and be able to flag privacy issues and have a foundational understanding, especially in the going back to context, in the context of whatever company you're in and what you're counseling. So also as someone who was GC and came up through the commercial corporate side of the house, um, for sure being able to flag and get the ball down the court for privacy issues and then be able to reach out to specialists, whether you're reaching out to outside counsel, um, or you're reaching out to specialists in-house if you're in a bigger um, team, knowing when to do that. And so you, you are enabled to move quickly in whatever your specialty is, whether you're employment counsel or your sales and marketing counsel or you're a, a deal lawyer, um, but partnering closely with your privacy counsel on those issues. So um, going back to the difference of uh, privacy and product counsel, you know, the way we think about it is product council is we are we are consumer data that so we're online we're a digital platform we deal with data that is the you know our product is 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 um is consumer data um and how we use it internally uh for the company and so product council is the front line 
primary counselors for privacy and data protection issues, but bring in the specialists when we need them. Uh, we also, um, Product Council looks to Privacy Council who will take new laws like CCPA, for example, or CPRA or um, uh, Brazil LGBTPD or, you know, looking at down the pike at India and, and saying, what do we think this is going to look like? How do we think this applies uh, to the company we're in? And then with product council. So then product council, it's a, it's a back and it's an iterative process because product council will know the details of the product and can um, give feedback to privacy council to come up with what are the guidelines is it, look is like. It hard, is it hard, Stephanie, being distributed now? Like, because I can imagine from what you just said, my immediate thought is, so number one, not everyone knows this, Twitter's not that huge of a company. Like, right. so at the headquarters, it's possible to go have conversations with the people that are relevant for the thing that you're dealing with. And so has it been harder to be distributed in that way? Because I think, you know, Twitter is, is is not so huge that it does still feel like people are connected? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say yes, in ways it is harder. Uh, you know, I miss my whiteboard. People are like, what do you miss the most? I mean, besides, I'm also a social preacher, so I like being in the room and having discussions, but I really miss the whiteboard. And I know there are jam boards and all kinds of <laughs> digital things, but they're not the same <laughs> um, to really be able to hash stuff out of how, how it's working. Uh, so it is harder in that way. At the same time, Twitter as a company was already leaning into uh, distributed teams. And um, I've had lots of great conversations with Pedro actually about this, of how do we, uh, how do we make distributed teams work? And because we need to for having one different perspectives, which I think is so important, especially for privacy. When you are an online uh, you have an online product, an online company. Your customers are not just in the U.S. They are certainly not just in the Bay Area in San Francisco. So how do you um, bring in talent who has those different perspectives and you can have a better, you can provide more robust, more um, well-rounded counseling for your clients. So we have to figure out a way to work it distributed. And I think, you know, the pandemic's terrible, but one of the maybe positive silver linings out of it, it is, has forced us all into figuring out how to do that. And my hope really is that continues going forward. And um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, uh, coming from the commercial side, I always think about things from a sales perspective of overcoming objections. So like, what were the objections around having distributed teams? And I think there were really strong ones for, for teams like pr a product in particular and privacy of you need to be where the client is. You've got to be in the room to have the whiteboard and to hash through the issues. And uh, the engineers are all in San Francisco. Um, so that's where you have to hire your product and privacy counsel. And at this point, I, ac I, I actually think that and the clients for product counsel will not all be at headquarters, wherever headquarters may be, because I do think there's a shift in, in the workforce. So that's one objection to overcome is like the clients are not actually going to be all in headquarters going forward. Another one um, objection is the communication piece, but we've all had to figure out how to deal with Zoom meetings and not having water cooler talk, another topic um, Pedro and I have talked about. And so how do we continue that going forward and find tools that make it even better? And then the last thing that I think is really important um, is, is supporting the people on our team so that we have people who want to stay and that helps product counseling because you have people who have built up their database of how the product works at that company and can provide historical context going forward when they're counseling. And if they're able to work in, uh, in their communities, it'll support them. And taking that even another step forward, why I think it's helpful, and this is not tied just to product counsel, is then they can give back in their local communities too. Um, which helps the company, like the, I think helps the company and, and the world going back to a mission driven place. Again, not specific to P Council, but, or privacy, but uh, I think we'll just help get that feedback loop for local context and local perspective and how your product is impacting the world locally and not just having a very insular um, Bay Area or New York or Boston or wherever the company is headquartered perspective on privacy issues and product consumer protection issues in the, 
in the product. I love everything you just said. I'll add one Christmas ornament to that uh, tree, which is um, diversity and inclusion. Like yes. all the things you said are valid, but if you if if we're really serious about what all these companies, particularly Silicon Valley companies, are talking about with diversification of the workforce and equal opportunities, and 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 hiring and retaining people of different backgrounds, you got to stop hiring in California, okay? Uh, especially uh, you know the Bay Area. I'm never going to live in the Bay Area. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't want to. I'm from the East Coast. I'm from South Florida. I'm a Cuban American. I don't want to be isolated in the Bay Area. Uh, so. I think there are lots of people like me with much more talent and ability than I have that uh, we're not tapping into. When I say we, I mean particularly tech companies, um, simply because we're not being creative. We haven't historically been creative about you know uh, uh, distributed workforces and hiring people in remote locations. I mean, I live in Atlanta. The unbelievable amount of talent here uh, on the legal side is is incredible. There's a lot of great law schools around here. There's a, Georgia Tech is up the street, so there's a lot of tech talent here. And I think now tech companies have figured out, like maybe we should stop asking people from Atlanta to move, to, right? <laughs> and then we, you know, we can take advantage of their talent. So totally with you. And I just wanted to add that one piece because it's important. And um, and often there's a lot of talk about diversification, diversifying the workforce, and and, and providing equal opportunity. But this is an easy way to do it. You know? Also global, like yeah, like yes look at the size of like <clears throat> Stephanie you're talking about a bunch of different laws Pedro you and I have talked about this before like we need subject matter experts on these laws people that <laughs> get the sensibility of that country what the consumers are going to care about like fundamental the, the the idea that you know privacy is a fundamental right is something we talk about a lot and that's different that's that's um, imbued differently into people in different regions and different cultures and so like we can't you all in particular with, with the, the breadth of your platforms, like you can't, you can't not service that you have to. 100% agree. And um, plus a thousand to Pedro's point. And this is something actually I've been, my team and I have been really focusing on because we've been in a really privileged position to be able to hire in the last year and a half. And it's something that we work really closely with our recruiting team on, and we've actually changed how we're posting jobs now. Nice. So uh, where we're looking for folks. And it, what's really interesting is the systems are not built for that. So interestingly, uh, a lot of the recruiting systems are built to have like one location that gets posted. And we're trying to figure out how do we let people know we're not just looking in one location, we're looking in multiple locations. Um, for these roles and so these are the kinds of things like the the objections are these these just structural issues even tooling together to make sure that we are looking elsewhere and people know when we post that we are open to other places um, we also are hiring product counsel outside of the us our first one so these are the these are the steps you know that i'm taking and will continue forward on on thinking about distributed teams in the first instance and and because it, it it gets harder to change it later in some ways and i think that it be by default and so how do you think about it early and when you do have an opportunity to, to hire how do you think about it at the beginning and not not at the end of the process um and particularly for diversity and inclusion reasons completely agree pedro one additional point there is really listening to my team over the last uh, seven months, people who have moved to the Bay Area, they want to go to their communities wherever that may be. For some people, it's it's still in California in different places. For other people, it's moving states. And um, so there's a desire even for folks who have moved here to move move to their communities wherever that may be. And how do we help them do that um, and support that those moves? Awesome. Shout out to Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm really, I'm really impressed with like how the companies handled the pandemic and the crazy, uh, you know, narratives. And, it's, and I'm happy to hear that on the inside, um, you guys are thinking deeply about these important issues. Super dope. Yeah. Not just Twitter. That's that's Stephanie and her team too. So, 
No. Thanks, Andy. No. <laughs> it is Twitter, but they, it's good to be in a company it's that both. supports it. It's both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got, we, I think we got to, we have to dance our way out of here. But, All right. Uh, but it's great. <laughs> it's been great. Uh, it's been great dancing, dancing with you and talking and, uh, and hanging out. Uh, we really appreciate your side ponytail and the denim. That's awesome. Got it. And the shoulder pad flow. And the shoulder, the shoulder pad. pad flow. We gotta go power 80s. Um, it, it's good. a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I love working with both of you. I'm so glad that uh, you're, I'm part of the privacy painters and uh, I know we will never have a boring day. So <laughs> yeah, we, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you in person in 2025. Absolutely. Uh, that yeah, that's right. Thanks, Andy and Pedro. All right, bye.